Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back. We're live with Marco Mangelsdorf for Amina, Marco, and me on Mondays about energy. We're so happy to be able to do that. Welcome back to your show, Marco. Well, I'm humbled. It's your show, and I'm just a, a itinerant traveler and a and a wandering uh, a wandering solar warrior, Jay. But thank you so much for having me back. I'm actually speaking to you from about three miles east of beautiful Kanaka Kai, looking across on a beautiful beautiful spring day here to the island of Lanai in the distance and a few white caps there in the channel. So uh, what better way to share that with my good buddy Jay Fidel. So thanks again. Okay. Do you mind if I refer to you through the show as a wandering solar warrior? Uh, I will accept that with the great humility and gratitude. Thank you, my friend. <laughs> okay. Marco, let's talk about some of the things that have been happening. We've entitled this show A Confluence of New Events About Energy. And indeed, it almost is, is some important things are happening right now that will probably cast a long shadow on the initiative for clean energy in Hawaii. So let's talk about SB 2100 first. That's been cooking in the legislature this session. Um, that could have a big effect. What's the status? Well, our friends in the ledge and the House and the Senate have put together quite a bouillabaisse, base, which is a French word for a fish soup, a hopefully tasty one, uh, as far as a bill that uh, has now been referred to a conference committee. And the both the House and the Senate have named the conferees who will be attending. Uh, I just checked the website for the ledge. Uh, recently and that hasn't been announced when that conference committee will take place it really has to take place within the next couple three days because we are rounding uh, wrapping things up at the legislature with final four votes scheduled for next monday and tuesday and then their pow their pow for the session so so this is the last week this is the this is the conference committee week and the frustrating thing about conference committee is yeah you can probably get in the room but you can't raise your hand and say, wait a minute, you guys, you should make a change here or pass it or don't pass it. You just have to sit there quietly, right? You know, you bring up a great point, Jay, and I'm ashamed to say that I don't know whether the public is allowed to partic not participate, but to be present during a conference committee. Do you happen to, to know whether that is uh, permissible? Gee, I, I th gee, I'm not sure now that you ask it that way. I I thought you could get in, but I'm pretty clear that you can't participate. You, I, I thought you could sit there quietly but not participate. Maybe you can't even well, get in. I, I don't know. I'll circle back to you uh, next next show, and, and we'll, we'll nail that down. Yeah, okay. The, 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 the co-chairs from the House side uh, are Chris Lee and Nicole Lowen, both great folks, uh -huh. and the chair and, and, and two other House members, so four House members. And then from the Senate side, uh, Senator Lorena Noe, who is chair of the Senate Energy Transportation Committee. She's the chair on the Senate side, and there will be three senators. So it will be a total of seven. And we're just waiting to see when the schedule, uh, when they're scheduled to meet. And this bill would uh, do several important things if it were to get out of conference in more or less its current form and make it to the governor's desk. It would ramp down over time the amounts uh, that uh, homeowners and business owners could claim for the installation of renewable energy systems. And uh, it would also increase the incentives to add battery storage, both uh, as part of a new system install for photovoltaic plus battery at the same time, and also adding battery storage to existing photovoltaic systems. So this is something that many of us in the industry have and others have wanted to see happen over the past several years. It failed last year. It failed 2016. So I'm lighting my incense sticks and, and doing my, uh, my perambulation circuit ambulations around the solar temple in hopes that uh, the third time will be a charm and uh, we will know very 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 soon whether uh, the third time will in fact uh, get it over the hump and get it to the governor's desk well um, you got the Senate and the House both passed it and the reason for the conference committee is that there are differences between their respective versions which they have to iron out Although I, 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 my recollection, uh, you know, to the procedural point you raised is that uh, even if there are uh, only limited differences between the two versions, 
the, the conference committee can go further and make other changes, even profound changes, uh, or they can kill it, I suppose. Um, so, you know, it's like, you know, you don't know what's, exactly what's going to happen in a conference committee these days. And so, I, you know, I would ask you, um, at, at least from the point of view of the two versions, what, what is in play here? I recall we talked about this before, and you said, well, there are blank lines for exactly, you know, what the, detail, the numbers are in terms of the ramp down, um, you know, of the, of the credits and the, uh, uh, you know, the new credits for um, storage and, and for storage that goes with old facilities. Um, but aside from those numbers, um, is there anything else in play here? And let me add, what, what are the numbers that are in play, if any, if we know of any numbers that are in play on those points? Well, I've, I've pretty carefully read both the Senate uh, draft version SD2 that came out of the Senate, and I've read the HD House draft 2 that came out of the House. And they are very, very close, Jay, very close, very similar language, except for the fact that Sylvia Luke's Finance Committee took out the monetary caps uh, for the various tax credits. They left the percentages, as in 25% for this tax credit, 30% for that tax credit, and so forth. But they, they uh, kind of surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, they took out, in, in Luke's committee, they took out the actual 25% or 5,000, or 25% of 3,000, or 3,000. They took out the 1,000 part. So clearly, a decision was made in that committee to punt it to the conference committee. So uh, we will see what they come up with. I mean, uh, I, I, I would have thought I would have made it out of conference last year or the year before, but it did not. So uh, I think, uh, I, I, let me put it this way, I would be surprised if there were wholesale changes to the bill in conference. So now one of the pieces of the puzzle, a really, really important piece, in fact, is what is the estimate of what this hit of, of these tax credits is going to be on the general fund? And as I've said a number of times on the show, you know, if you go back and look at the past three years' worth of uh, data that we have for tax credits in Hawaii, uh, 2013, 14, and 15, almost half a billion dollars was claimed for the renewable energy tax credit far and away, the most, uh, shall I say, expensive tax credit that the state has had over the years. So as part of squaring the numbers, money in, money out, having a balanced budget, you need to have some idea of, well, if we pass this bill, what's going to be the hit on the state's finances? And I don't envy those the data, the data crunchers and the prognosticators because trying to come up with some estimates of, of what the tax credit hit is going to be for these new tax credits uh, in next year, the year after, the year after, I mean, that's an, a huge guessing game. But, but they got to guess nonetheless, right, because you can't just go blindly throwing out tax credits here and there and not have it have, have, it have an effect on the state's overall financial solvency, right? Sure, sure. You now, you mentioned a, a cap a minute ago. What, what's the cap? Is the cap the amount of credit that an individual taxpayer can take, or is a cap the total amount of credits that would be available, you know, to everyone? What, what's the cap you're talking about? Oh, good question. Yeah, it's the former, not the latter, Jay. So if, let's say, uh, Jay Fidel wants to put in a system, a photovoltaic system with or without batteries, you can get, let's say, 25% of the cost of that system paid for through a state tax credit or $5,000, whichever is less, or $3,000, whichever is less, or X dollars, whichever is less. So it's not a gross cap that, that you, individuals and, and businesses will only be able to claim a total of you know, $500 million or, or some gross sum, but it, it refers specifically to what individual tax filers or business tax filers can claim. Well, it all seems pretty positive to me. I mean, I think uh, I wouldn't stand in the way of the ramp down. Uh, I think uh, they, they've been talking about having a ramp down for a long time, 10 years anyway. Um, and um, I, I think it's a good time to talk about uh, giving credit for storage, because storage is a really important part of going forward here. And um, having a cap is not an unreasonable, you know, not an unreasonable arrangement. I guess the question is how much the cap, and as, as you pointed out, the, the macroeconomic question of how much is this going to cost the state. It's, it's a little confused these days about how much the state has, how much the state is trying to take advantage of the federal uh, tax Reform Act, 
um, you know, whether there's enough money to do what we want to do and uh, whether we can, you know, afford to spend a lot or maybe we should be restrained. And this is, this is maybe one of those bills which somehow gets involved in that conversation. Uh, if it's un unknown, then it's unrestrained, and that creates a problem for having a balanced budget, no? I agree. I agree. Yeah. You gotta you gotta make sure the numbers in ma match numbers out, and vice versa. So uh, it's, uh, it's yeah, it's crunch time, and we'll we'll see what uh, what yeah. what comes out in the days to come. Yeah, this could this could have a big effect on uh, the installers and on on the installation of solar in general. Okay, let's go to point two. Uh, Jennifer Potter. I met her um, at, at a legislative hearing um, a couple of weeks ago. She's very charming, very nice, and I was happy to meet her. And she was at that time seeking confirmation. Uh, how did that go? Well, she she wowed him and wooed him, Jay. Uh, she got a 24 to zero vote uh, in the Senate last week to confirm her nomination by Governor Ige. The only one who didn't vote was uh, with an excuse absence. Kind of remember reminds me back in school days whether you had an excuse or unexcused absence. But uh, Cynthia, not sorry, uh, Laura Thielen, Senator Thielen, I believe, was the one who had, who was excused from the vote. So uh, there are 25 members of the Senate. She got 24 to nothing, and she will take uh, uh, Lorraine Akiba's seat, so to speak, when uh, Commissioner Akiba uh, rides off into the sunset after a successful uh, uh, six years, I believe, full term at the PUC, and that will end uh, June 30th, and Jenny Potter will be uh, cranking away at her desk, I'm sure, on July 1st, hard at it. I feel really... Uh, bullish about her appointment. I think a uh, very interesting choice in the Gov's, uh, uh, from the Gov's perspective to go out of the, take it from the deep bench, essentially, of HNEI. And um, uh, she's, uh, I think, going to be a great addition to, uh, to uh, Jay Griffin and to uh, Chenator, uh, Chairman Iwase. So uh, I, I think it was a great choice, and uh, I expect great things from uh, Ms. Potter. Yeah, that's great. And uh, it's, it's nice to see, uh, you know, um, uh, fresh faces and uh, uh, try to imagine how that's going to all work out. Do you have any thoughts about how she would change the tilt, the mindset, the collective mindset of the PUC? Uh, that's more kind of difficult to prognosticate, but uh, I mean, Lorraine Akibo, I think very highly of. She is an attorney by training, and I think has really given it uh, an incredible effort and, and done great things at the commission. Uh, Randy Iwase is an attorney. Jay is a PhD uh, with a very deep understanding uh, of uh, wonkish issues in terms of energy. I have a lot of respect and aloha for Jay. And uh, Jenny is uh, also comes from the wonkish side. She's not an attorney, but she. She's worked for Sacramento Municipal Utility District, also known as SMUD, Lawrence Berkeley Labs, and knows uh, more so than perhaps uh, virtually anybody else who's been on that commission for a long time uh, what actually is going on at utilities in the 21st century and the changes that are, are happening. Well, right I think that's, that's where it sounds positive in the sense that we'd like to know what's going on in the mainland. We'd like some in-depth knowledge about that. And, um, you know, uh, although attorneys uh, do understand a lot of the, um, you know, legal infrastructure about energy, um, it's also good to have policy wonks and, and people, policy wonks who are familiar with the technology. To me, this is very important going forward. So this may all be a, a, a good mix right now with uh, the chair being a lawyer and then um, two, two people, uh, two, two commissioners who are into uh, policy and technology. I, I kind of like that mix. Anyway, as do I. As do I. I think it's uh, it's it's a great great lineup. I mean, we've had bright longs before, like our friend Mike Champley. Certainly mm -hmm. came yeah. from utility, uh, yeah. had a good utility background. Uh, Mina legislature. Uh, who else? Les Condo, who moved on to, uh, uh, what is he, the state uh, auditor right now, uh, Carl Caliboso, uh, also an attorney. So it's going to be interesting to see John Cole as well, who's now with HNEI. Mm -hmm. Kind of interesting to see some of the folks who have filtered in and filtered out of that, com out of that commission over the past several years. This is, this is all, you know, it's all relevant to um, one particular docket that the PUC recently opened up, and I want to cover that right after this break, Marco. 
That's Marco Mangelsdorf of ProVision Solar. Joins us from Kanaka Kai. Uh, we'll be right back after this short break. We'll talk about a, a special new docket that the PUC has recently opened up. Hi, my name is Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review, coming to you from Honolulu, Hawaii, right here in the center of the Pacific Ocean. Asian Review is the oldest of the 35 or so shows um, uh, broadcast by Think Tech Hawaii. We've been in production since 2009. Our goal is to provide you, the viewer, with information, breaking information about events in Asia. Asia being anything from Hawaii west to Pakistan, from the Russian uh, Far East, south to Australia and New Zealand. We hope to see you every Monday afternoon at 5 p.m. Okay, we're back. Uh, Marco Mangelsdorf and me. Marco joins us by, by Zoom, actually, uh, from Envoip, uh, from Kanaka Kai Molokai. And uh, we're talking about uh, a, a confluence of new and important events and developments in energy that seem to be happening right now. So all the, all the things are happening together, and they all affect each other. So one of the things that happened, and this is before Jennifer Potter will have been seated, is the PUC opened a, an unusual docket, a docket um, seeking to determine performance standards uh, to modify the existing utility business model of both utilities in this state. And that's very interesting, especially when you take, take it together with the fact that there was a bill pending. I don't know if that bill is, is still around. There's a bill pending for a similar effect in the legislature. Do you know if that bill is still around, Marco? Yeah, it's sitting on the governor's desk. That's why this, the timing is really kind of interesting because uh, a bill landed on the gov's desk a couple weeks ago that would have mandated that the Public Utilities Commission open a new docket to look at what's known as performance-based regulation. It can also be referred to as performance-based incentives or using performance-based metrics and essentially uh, proposes uh, what would be a rather wholesale, very dramatic change to the way investor-owned utilities in the state, and there is only one, really. I mean, I should say there are three. There's HECO, HELCO, MECO, but they're all part of Owen Electric Industries, and HELCO and MECO are subsidiaries of HECO. Uh, pointedly, Jay, pointedly, KIUC was left out, so they are not part, they would not be part of the oh, proceedings. Oh, okay. So here you have this bill that was passed by this, the legislature sitting on the ghost desk, and lo and behold, last week the commission decides to open a docket prior to any bill being signed, prior to being mandated to do so. So, you know, of course the commission just can't whip up a docket willy-nilly. I mean, it, there's a lot of time and effort prep work that goes into to doing something like this. So clearly they were working on it in the months before. So I, I don't know, you know, politically uh, what the timing was. Well, the timing was such that, uh, you know, if they stole the gov's thunder, I'm not sure, you know, if they, if they did that. But now the governor has a bill on his desk uh, that, if he were to sign it, would mandate the commission to do something that they just did. <laughs> so how is that going to work out? I, I'm not sure. Yeah, well, maybe there's differences between the, the you know, well, what, the, what the, the PUC has uh, put in its docket and what, but what is in that bill. It may not be the same thing. But let me ask you some questions. So we've established that the, the bill does not cover KIUC. Does the docket cover KIUC? Neither. No, no nor, neither the bill nor the docket, which is 
officially 2018-0088, 2018-0088, mm-hmm. and you can find it on the, the PUC DMS data management service website or system website, mm-hmm. and neither of the current docket, which is open, nor the bill sitting on EGA's desk covers Koi Island Utility Co-op. Do you have a sense of whether the bill and the docket are the same, or are there substantial differences? I, I haven't really... Uh, well, the, the bill was just telling, would, would, like I said, mandate the commission to go ahead and open a docket, but the docket itself, which runs about 60 pages, I should say the initial filing runs about 60 pages, of course provides uh, way, way more detail, depth and breadth of detail than the, the bill that's sitting on the governor's desk. Yeah, so it wouldn't so, be inconsistent then. It wouldn't, it, so what you have is the detail that, they, that the PUC would have had to look at anyway. Yeah. The other thing that strikes me is that um, this is unusual, isn't it, for the PUC to initiate a docket all by themselves to respond to on their own motion? Um, this, is, this is quite a you know, notable event, isn't it? Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't exactly characterize it like that, Jay. I, I, they, they do it from time to time, uh, kind of on their own volition. So it's not all that unusual of a thing to do. Um, I mean, I think it holds both promise and and some peril here. And uh, they are saying in phase one, uh, under the the docket that just opened last week, they would allow the stakeholders to kind of throw ideas and see what sticks out there. And I I have the concern that, you know, if if it's anything close to or or let alone even more kind of uh, crazy than uh, compared to the, the Hawaii uh, Hawaiian Electric Industries next year, a docket where there were a 27 at one point, 27 interveners. I see kind of a free-for-all possibility where you'll have dozens and dozens of parties, including the usual suspects, uh, that will be applying to be interveners uh, and individuals, companies, interest groups far and wide. So it could be a real blankety-blank uh, in terms of a free-for-all as far as Dozens of parties who will have ideas as to how Hawaiian Electric should dramatically change their entire business model. Mm. So I, I think it has the potential to be rather, rather messy. And uh, as far as uh, what's going to be the end result, it's too early to tell. Interestingly, one of the things that the docket pointedly leaves off the table, and they say this very explicitly, that this docket is not to consider alternate utility ownership models, not to consider alternate models. Uh, So we'll just have to wait for our friends at Boston Consulting and London Economics, who got that close to $1 million uh, grant, not grant, but uh, a project uh, from, uh, from DVED, to look at alternate uh, utility ownership models, and we should have that report hopefully uh, in six to eight months just prior to the 2019 legislative session. So if you kind of fast forward, within the next seven, eight, nine months, there could be a lot of really juicy stuff happening both on this docket in terms of uh, performance-based regulation and also the report that the state is paying close to a million bucks for looking at alternate models to IOUs, investor-owned utilities. So uh, I think we're really uh, we're really kind of on a cutting edge here. Another thing that struck me when I read through the the initial filing from the commission is that we are really uh, going in in terra incognita here, Jay. While they cite other states such as Rhode Island, Ohio, New York, Minnesota, and even the U.K. looking at performance-based regulation, the reality reality is none of them have actually embarked 100% down this path. So there's very, very little of a actual track record that I know of where any utility in the United States has really been doing this much at all or for any length of time. So it, it, it essentially is it's turning on its head the whole notion of an investor in utility, which is you, you spend more to make more. You, you borrow money. You get capital, you do infrastructure projects, grid modernization, and you get that money back through increasing uh, the rate base, right? So there's an incentive, or so the commission argued, there's an incentive to spend more to make more. And they are wanting to put together, you know, a stakeholder group through this docket and come up with an alternate means or alternate model 
for an investor-owned utility to operate that would not be based on spend more and more and more and get more and more and more back in terms of rate of return or rate of return on equity, but to look at what's best for the rate payer. Uh, so I see this actually as something of a threat once Wall Street really begins to understand this on a deeper level in terms of how is, is moving in this direction going to affect stakeholders, uh, I mean, excuse me, shareholders. Yeah. So, well, let me ask you a couple of questions that come to mind yeah. on this. Um, does the report, the million dollar report you mentioned, does that also include a change of the uh, of the rate, uh, you know, the rate arrangements, the rate the rate provisions, such as performance based rates, or is that merely ownership? I don't know for sure, Jay, but I'm tempted to say the latter, not the former. Yeah, that's what I, I, I my recollection would be the same. So it's really interesting to see at some point these these two things can meet. They get ownership and uh, rate and uh, rate making. On the other hand, maybe rate making will resolve problems that the people who want to, you know, investigate ownership have had and maybe maybe resolve those problems so it isn't necessary to get into questions of ownership. Uh, who knows? But, you know, there's, there's, there's obviously two tracks, two trains on this track. Um, the other thing I, I want to ask you is what, what kind of performance uh, standards are we talking about here? Uh, it seems like a pretty vague term, and I wonder at least from the PUC filing, there must be some indication of uh, what kinds of performance standards we're talking about. Well, you nailed it, Jay. I mean, that's what's up in the air. And, and whose performance standards, what metrics are going to be used? And when you get dozens of, of, of stakeholders who are going to be uh, making a claim that this or that uh, metric uh, in terms of performance is the best one or is the most important one to focus on, I mean, it, it's going to be a real free-for-all. And I got to tell you, from the perspective of being a small business owner, that you know, Hawaiian Electric Industries is a publicly traded company. But for all intents and purposes, although they're a publicly regulated uh, monopoly in terms of producing, uh, producing and transmitting power across their service territories, I mean, for all intents and purposes, they're a private company, right? Even though they've got public uh, shareholders, so. How does a private company take to essentially being told by outside entities that they need to dramatically change their business model? I mean, you know, I may, I may be misinterpreting it. I may be a little bit overly sensitive about it. But I, I, there's a part of me that just kind of uh, gets my hackles up, the notion that private companies should be told how to – dramatically uh, and irrevocably change the whole nature of their business. I mean, yeah, I understand the argument for the docket, and I, I certainly support the docket being open, but at the same time, you know, I consider the perspective from Hawaiian Electric on this, uh, and, and I'm not, you know, I don't have any inside information, but again, there's a part of me that as a small business owner is I'm thinking, this this seems kind of, uh, kind of uh, I won't call it draconian by I guess that's not the right word, but it, it, it's a pretty, pretty big move to, to, to make efforts to, to change the business model from the outside of one of the oldest, uh, longest standing, most venerable companies in the state. Yeah, and the country for that matter. <clears throat> you know, and you wonder uh, if there's been law developed in other, in other jurisdictions on how far, um, you know, the, uh, the PUC or the legislature can go in terms of, uh, you know, uh, ch changing the essential um, profit process of of a given utility. I mean, this is it could be it could be draconian, as you say. Which leads me to a thought I wanted to express to you and see what your reaction is. You know, a lot of the people who you, I think you correctly surmise might want to be stakeholders in this are people who um, you know were, were opposing the next era deal, uh, who have been attacking the utility for years and years. Who you know, you know, are just not going to agree with anything the utility would say, just as a, as, as a historical matter. Uh, the utility, I expect, would be very reasonable in these discussions, um, but they're going to they're going to find a bunch of people in that room, in that in that um, stakeholder group, whoever is permitted as um, interveners, um, you know, who are not not very concerned about uh, uh, retention of the essential profit motive of the, of the utility. And that suggests that um, we're going to have a long, tough 
argument about this in the PUC. This is gonna this is gonna suck all the uh, the oxygen. Arguably, gonna suck all the oxygen out of the PU, uh, out of the utilities' efforts to move forward and to do its grid modernization and all that. Uh, so you really wonder uh, if this is going to go to a good place or going to devolve into a, a long and uh, um, a long and destructive argument. What do you think? Well, if I recall correctly, phase one, there's phase one and phase two. Phase one is kind of the discovery where the free-for-all takes place. I believe the commission said they expect it to last around nine months, so that takes us into early 2019. So there, there could be quite a lot of the free-for-alling, so to speak, over the next eight or nine months. And then phase two is going to be trying to uh, distill down from phase one uh, avenues and, and ways to go from here. But like I said earlier, I really do see this as Terra Incog. I was I was reading this docket opening very carefully to try to see what what experience have others had and they and like I said earlier they referred to what other states were trying or just starting to try or looking at you know dating back to all of last year I mean so this is pretty brand spanking new for what I can tell so it's 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 again it's good that the commission is open this docket. What's going to be the actual result? Is it going to lead to to better performance? And how do you how do you what metrics do you come up with to measure that performance? Is it uh, is it on time for the grid? Is it lower electric rates? Is it better customer service? And so forth and so on. It's really it, there there ain't no kind of blueprint that has been established that that people can hark to and say, oh well, these folks have been doing it successfully for five years or ten years or twenty years. We can learn from them. No, everybody is kind of learning from each other as we kind of fumble our way into the, 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 the relative unknown here. Yeah, well, and that could lead to, um, you know, a delay of the initiative and complication with the initiative and uh, people not wanting to proceed for the lack of certainty. Um, and I think it's a real risk. But I also think that the PUC, if it handles this right, um, can, can keep that to a minimum and do this on a constructive basis, and um, you know we'll, be, we'll all be better off if that takes place. So a lot of this is really, you know, on the desk, uh, the collective desks of the commissioners, including Jennifer Potter of the PUC, to make sure this happens in a way uh, that you know it's constructive and doesn't get in the way of our primary mission. Here, here, brother. Here, here. Okay, well, we're out of time, as usual. Um, sorry about that. Uh, why don't we do this again in two weeks, Marco, okay? And, in fact, in two weeks, we have none other than Ms. Jenny Potter, who will be joining us as a uh, soon-to-be newly minted commissioner at the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission. So she will be our, our guest donor and uh, our special guest. Yes, indeed. That would be great. So if you're around, you should listen to this one, Jenny Potter, comes on Think Tech. We'll have a great discussion about these very points. Thank you, Marco. Mahalo Nui, my friend. Thank you. Mahalo.